Hello and welcome to Distillations. I'm Michal Meyer, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at CHF. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. And I'm feeling quite pleased because we've dedicated this show entirely to history. Sorry, Bob. I'll do my best to keep up. We want to take you back in time. So pretend you're not listening to this podcast on a 21st century device and come geek out with us as we explore the scientific worlds of the 16th and 17th centuries. Science and the supernatural in the 17th century. Most people have heard the stories of Galileo and Newton, but who were their peers? And what was it like to practice science at that time? We'll talk to two historians of science, Deborah Harkness and CHF's own Jim Vogel, both experts on this time period. I urged it with a greater flame and then the glass broke. Science, trickery, witchcraft, and explosions, all coming up on Distillations. We'd like to welcome Deborah Harkness and James Vogel to the show. Deborah is a historian of science and medicine at the University of Southern California and the author of the All Souls Trilogy, a popular historical fantasy series filled with witches, vampires, demons, scientists, and historians. Jim is a historian of science and the curator of rare books at CHF. He is also an expert on Johannes Kepler, a 17th century astronomer, mathematician, and astrologer. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. In the 21st century, we have certain ideas and assumptions about what science is about. It includes atoms. It doesn't include astrology. In the 16th and 17th century, what were people's assumptions about the natural world? Well, I think the most important thing is to realize that the natural world and the supernatural world were inextricably connected. They were linked together. So whereas we might think that there's a natural world and a very thick wall that might keep it away from something that would be na- labeled supernatural or above nature, in the period that I work in, the 16th century, it was a much much more of a sort of a transparent see-through curtain. And you could poke things through from one side to the other pretty easily. So when something unexpected happened, when something inexplicable happened, the way that most people would explain it was just that there had been some kind of an interchange or a connection between the natural and supernatural worlds. And that that became just sort of the dominant way to understand why something like astrology would work. That the heavens were, by definition, supernatural. They were above the natural world. They would poke their influence down through that thin curtain into the natural world below. And it was a whole very interconnected system. And, and would you say that in that context, people just knew that that's the way things were? There was no questioning of that as the relationship between the natural, the supernatural, everything that existed? I think there was questioning of it. I think people were interested in exactly how it worked why it worked, why sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work, Mm -hmm. why sometimes it worked for good effects and why sometimes bad effects. But I think that their cosmology was such that biblical authorities, ancient authorities, medieval commentators on those authorities were all in perfect harmonious agreement that there was, you know, a, a sublunar world that was the natural world full of change and corruption that we lived in. And there was a supernatural world above it where things were different and that there were influences that went down, trickled down, and also that percolated up. Uh, And they were increasingly worried about that, actually, as time went on. You know, what effects might their bad way of living or war be having, you know, could it be having an adverse effect on the supernatural world? Is that why there were more comets? Is that why there... So to say that they didn't question it, I think, isn't quite right. But it takes a long time for the basic underlying cosmological premises to be unpacked and unraveled and changed. I'm reminded here of uh, Johannes Kepler's experience when his mother was put on trial as a witch. He took a break from his job and went to uh, defend her in her witch trial. And the 
basis of the defense of his mother was not that there is no such thing as witches, but that she was not a witch. So, Jim, I'll, I'll just explain to our listeners who might not have much background on Johannes Kepler who he was. He was a very significant mathematician and astronomer in the late 16th and early 17th century. He was the imperial mathematician to the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II. And he was the man who, in some ways, put the planets in their course. He was the one that worked out that the planets go in elliptical orbits. So, you know, even for someone as modernish looking as Kepler, the idea that his mother was a witch, well, she wasn't a witch, but there was no question that there were witches. You were talking about the, you know, the 16th century cosmos with this, with the sublunar realm. And the, even when that begins to break down, with people like Kepler, who's a Copernican, and they start to think of the Earth going around the sun, and and they begin to break through to thinking about the universe, maybe not so contained. They still think fundamentally about God's creation of the universe, and God is never more than. Uh, a half a step or a half a breath away when talking about the construction of the universe and the functioning of its parts. So how how does that that permeable boundary between the natural and the supernatural affected how people thought about and, and did science? I think it's about the ways in which that boundary can be manipulated. How do you cross it? How do you do it safely? What might you pick up along the way that might be desirable or undesirable? I think there's also a sort of sense of supernatural knowledge, something that I think Kepler did in some way, uh, you know, for him, he had such a, a fabulous mind for sort of assimilating data and information. But that idea that somehow everything was knowable, you know, for a lot of scientific figures, that seemed to be a sort of a supernatural aspiration, but not an unachievable aspiration, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I'm thinking too about things like uh, natural magic, where the, the goal is to manipulate nature, to make it do things that you want it to do, not necessarily, although sometimes, invoking a evil spirit, but usually just invoking nature and its operations. Can you give me some examples from your own work about how this would have worked in real life at the time? The section in Della Porta on the magnet, which was kind of a spooky thing because you can you can make things happen at a distance and you can make things turn and you can and the yet then the power can go through things like wood and paper. And Della Porta has a whole list of things that magnets do, including such things as whether uh, garlic causes magnetism to cease, right? For which reason it was said that steersmen and navigators on ships weren't allowed to eat onions and garlic because they would demagnetize the compass. And Della Porta reports that in fact this is a wives' tale because he's talked to seamen and they would rather die than not have garlic. Deborah, you mentioned religion and you mentioned safe boundaries to cross and it brings to my mind when you have a strong dogmatic religious authority that's saying, do not question God, do not question the way nature's put together, then doesn't that sort of define a, an unsafe boundary to cross? There were certainly people who said that anyone who dealt with science or with magic um, were equally dangerous mm -hmm. to the commonwealth and to good religious people. But at the same time, most popes had astrologers on staff and uh, virtually everyone was religious. Newton was certainly deeply religious. Mm. Kepler was certainly deeply religious. And, and so there was really nothing, um, you know, people were fairly clear that God had given us minds to reason with. And okay. he had given us texts to interpret. One of them was the book of scripture and one of them was the book of nature. And trying to do the mental gymnastics to fit what you observed in the book of scripture and the book of nature together was no mean feat and was very challenging. Um, but they felt that it all made sense to God. Therefore, if they were confused, they'd better keep questioning. So I think that it, it's, it's, uh, it's unsafe in the sense that you could run into unforeseen circumstances. There could be, there, there was a belief in good and evil. There could be just, you know, the whole universe was not full of just benign influences. Right. And that's where the danger sort of crept in. You could take your own sin into science 
and corrupt the outcome uh, in, in ways that perhaps a, a modern scientist wouldn't be too concerned about going into their lab. But mm -hmm. that's where really the, the danger sort of would, would, would creep in. It, it wasn't the questioning itself. Now, I always say, you know, one of the problems with magic um, is that like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. Someone on the outside could look and say, that's very dangerous indeed. But it didn't stop people questioning. You know, it didn't stop Kepler. What's interesting is that one of the ironies is that the people who got into trouble mostly, the scientists who got into trouble with religious issues, were mostly for religious issues. So Kepler had a great deal of trouble with his own Lutheran church over his interpretation of the Eucharist, and in fact was excommunicated, the only Lutheran I know of who was. I'm sure there are many more, but this does not something you run into that often. Uh, Newton, likewise, uh, was quite heretical, actually, in his, heretical. in his anti-Trinitarian beliefs. So it, for those two cases, at least, their problem with the church was was actually theological. The one person you know, who we all know, of course, was <laughs> Galileo. And Galileo gets in trouble mostly for putting the primacy of astronomy over theology. That is to say, he puts forth a position in which he says, Scripture needs to be interpreted, and as far as the structure of the solar system goes, you theologians wait until we astronomers tell you what it is, and then you can go and you can you can interpret in those spots in between. But we scientists will stake out for you what the truth is. That, that's a case where Galileo basically said, I'll have the book of nature over the book of scripture. And, you know, that the book of the book of scripture tells you how to get to heaven, not how heaven goes. So, so it becomes a power struggle as to uh, who has better access to God. It's who gets to be first in line in the interpretation of scripture. And Galileo wanted to interpose himself in front to say, here is the structure of nature, and once I've told you what it is, then you can decide what the scripture means within the constraints that I lay out to you. And people who interpreted scripture weren't used to be told that sort of thing. He basically said, I'm not going to tell you how to interpret scripture. I just want to tell you how to interpret the book of nature, and then you do what you want with scripture. Right. But he kind of was really treading on their job description. And, you know, the ones who get seriously in trouble, Bruno, much more serious, Giordano Bruno, mm -hmm. per, you know, promoter of an idea that there was an infinity of worlds, you know, again, was one of the ones who said, you know, I just want to tell you a few things. What you do with it is up to you. But this is how it really is. Papal infallibility was a fairly serious intellectual concern at this point. All of Europe was, you know, ravaged by religious wars and dissensions about matters of faith. So to kind of say, go in there and say, you got it wrong on the infinity thing, and I'm here to tell you why, do with it what you will, that's just going to get you into... Pr if he had said, I'm going to tell you something about the color blue, mm -hmm. it would have gotten him... A you know, it, it was just, it was not the right moment or the right style of argumentation. And, and many of these people were, you know, very well connected to the church. You know, Galileo's daughter was a nun. Bruno was a monk. Uh, Copernicus was also a monk. There's nothing inherently antithetical between an interest in the natural world and, and faith in this period. It's just about what happens in these moments of controversy during a very challenging time for the church. So Deborah, you, in your research, you have studied the more common people, not so much the elites, but ordinary people who perhaps we wouldn't have expected to be interested in science in the 16th and early 17th century. What were they trying to do? That's a great question. Um, I think what they were trying to do was to to manipulate the natural world to their advantage. It was a very difficult life. Um, every advantage you would have in that life you would exploit, whether it was the number of children you had, your family connections, or the secrets you had about how to churn butter better or keep cheese from spoiling or make really excellent adulterated wine. And all of those things are about a half a step away from chemistry or some other form of science. Astrology, similarly, was just a way to help in a very difficult set of life circumstances where you were on the edge of survival at all times, um, you know, that, that knowing something about the natural world, maybe feeling you had a way of controlling 
the natural world and outcomes related to it, I think was just, you know, part and parcel of lived experience at the time. So who were some of these people that you study? Oh my goodness, um, blacksmiths, goldsmiths, apothecaries, grocers, uh, merchants who had access to all kinds of foreign goods and botanical specimens. Really people from almost every walk of life, midwives, herb wives, gardeners. Uh, you know, the, the scientific project is a very large one and it requires all kinds of specialized expertise in the period that I study in the 16th century. What's, what's interesting about, you know, about the 16th and 17th century and what happens in science during that period, the parts of science that are, let us say, less messy are the ones that get, that get really advanced, right? So astronomy, um, celestial mechanics, uh, motion of local bodies, th things like that, that are relatively clean problems, they make a great deal of progress on. But that does not to say that there isn't, isn't a huge amount of interest and activity in the messier problems like metallurgy and, and pharmacology and those things. But they just don't, they don't uh, solve in a such spectacularly clear way. So looking back as historians, we tend to say, oh, they made a huge amount of progress in astronomy in this period. And, and we tend to overlook all of those, um, those messy... Uh, small gains. Small gains in, uh, you know, the, the more chemical, let us say, sciences, which don't really begin to resolve for another hundred years or so. Um, but it's not, for it's not for want of effort. There's a huge amount of effort, a huge right. amount of activity. Uh, it's just they were extremely difficult subject areas. Also very costly, you know, crockery, glassware. This was expensive stuff and it broke a lot. Um, if you're working over a charcoal fire and you don't have a very fine regulation of temperature and you also don't, you know, one of the things I always have to remind my students, there's no purity of metal. So when you're buying on the market silver, there were certain kinds of purity tests, but what else was could be in it and whether it was adulterated and what, what mine it came from and what, how much other materials were in there. I mean, that was the kind of thing that could, you know, lead to explosions and problems and things turning blue and all of the things we read about in chemistry. And, but, it, it, but they kept doggedly at it, trying to replicate results. So I bought a new cache of, of, of silver. Why can't I get the same results that I got from the old stuff I got out of Germany? Well, because it's not the same. Um, and But it really is amazing to sort of see the amount of energy and their absolute confidence that they will crack it. I've worked for many years uh, with the chemistry of Isaac Newton project with Newton's alchemical manuscripts. And some of them are laboratory notebooks where he, he just gives one trial after another. And the number of trials that end with I urged it with a greater flame and then the glass broke. The, it's a huge number of experiments and badly in Newton's, in Newton's laboratory, just because, uh, as you said, that things, you know, things aren't pure, glass is weak, um, the, the, the fire is too hot or too cold. Someone um, falls asleep, <laughs> Someone falls. fire goes out. <laughs> it's a huge number of uh, technical problems that can beset the chemist of the 17th century. Which is why most receipt books from the period, most chemical recipe books, the last four or five pages of, of each book is full of cements and other uh, ma means by which you can glue your broken pots back together. Uh, because, you know, you, you, don't ha you frankly don't have the money to be buying all new stuff all the time. And so being able to be a nice repair guy was a, a crucial if you're going to be a chemist. So you, you talked earlier about uh, it being a difficult uh, period in history and, and people struggling to find advantage. Uh, advantage over circumstances, not advantage over other human beings. It, it, isn't, it isn't as much of a competitive framework, one human with another human, as it is a uh, uh, struggle for survival against circumstances. Is that fair? Kepler was a pretty competitive guy. <laughs> Wouldn't you say? I'm trying to think of what we who would compete for. I mean, you might compete for favor, for instance, or for fame. Well, in, in the basic sense, do you compete for food? Do you compete for shelter? Do you compete for survival? I think you, you, you are because what I would say 
you know, Kepler's livelihood, his housing. I mean, he, he's living in imperially supplied housing, for one thing. So if he falls out of favor, he's, he's, he's going to have to look for a new place to live. And actually, not everybody wants an alchemist, astrologer, fill in the blank, living next door, um, because they can be troublesome neighbors. But success then and now was was a difficult cutthroat business mm -hmm. and um most people had to multitask very few people got away with being you know the court mathematician and not doing horoscopes on the side mm -hmm. or a few alchemical experiments for private clients or tutoring them in the art of memory or whatever it might be that you had to offer so you were constantly looking and wanting to keep and preserve even if the very highest levels sort of your place in society, and that was how your family was eating and getting clothes. So it, it really is um, where your survival is. And it might be true that it, among my people in London, cooperation was more important than competition because they so desperately needed the support and help of their neighbors not to turn them into the authorities when, as some did, you, you built a blast furnace in your backyard in downtown London, which could explain such things as the Great Fire a hundred years later, right? right. If, you're gonna, if you're a Venetian glassmaker and you built a blast furnace in a very crowded urban condition, you might run into trouble. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, so that, um, you know, and he was like, but I, I generate such high heat. It's good for the chemistry, you know, yeah. bad for the neighbors. But, you know, at a time when, when you needed the cooperation of your neighbors, where you were going to break things, where you needed to be on very good terms with people to get materials etc cooperation up you know for a would have been very very important i think then as you work your way up and you become you get this reputation then maybe you switch into a slightly more competitive mode because at that point you're the one everybody wants to be associated with so that's an interesting question about that kind of relationship between competition probably not so different from today so what would people from that time period find very strange about the science of today what would they find familiar and what would they find strange they would love all the things we have that would do action at a distance can you imagine how excited they'd be to hit a light switch and have lights go on across the room they would just be like thank you we knew this was possible I, I imagine that one of the things that they would find quite quite puzzling is how science is somewhat disconnected from society. And nowadays, science has been re retreated to the to the realm of expertise um, in a way that it really wasn't at the time. There was uh, a huge number of people of all levels of society had something to say or some interest, and. And today, this very kind of artificial distancing of the scientific expert from society. I, mean, I think that would puzzle people very much. Yeah, I think they would, on the one hand, they would think uh, a modern laboratory setup was really wonderful. They would think, this is great. This is kind of what I had always hoped for. Then I think they would get inside it, and they would find it a bit lonely. I think Oops. they would also be fascinated by this whole how state funding worked. You know, all of the things like the National Science Foundation, they would again think... Be deeply, deeply puzzling. Deeply that. strange. <laughs> yeah. Is that. that because such people would be used to a system of either you're wealthy or you have patronage from an individual? I, I go back to the, the idea that the people practicing science are such a relatively small elite mm -hmm. now. that, And then the people that they get funding for are an even smaller elite. Um, and so I think that you're average run-of-the-mill 16th or 17th century person would would be surprised that we had s sequestered this activity off into such a small group of people who were relatively disconnected from the rest of us. I th that's, yeah. that's my sense. And I think they would sometimes find it hard, you know, so many of their patent applications or their applications for funding were about doing something really um, of absolute obvious practical worth and use. I have an even faster, better way to make salt. Mm -hmm. Here you go. And the number of people saying that in patent applications <laughs> is high because salt was an extremely important product and they mm -hmm. never had enough of it. And so anybody who could come up with yet another better salt pan um, was, was, was on to something. But I think that, you know, just seeing how you could ask for funding to do, a, you know, a, 
a small slice of a much bigger project to perfect this aspect. It would take them a while to, to figure that out because for them it was about the whole thing. Your 16th and 17th century observer would, would be interested in, uh, interested in the ex explicit lack of mention of God in scientific work because it is so prominent in so many uh, scientific works of the 16th and 17th centuries, the primacy of God's position in the, in the work itself. And that's something that you almost never see anymore, except maybe the labeling of the God particle. Mm -hmm. I think that as long, you know, for a 16th century person today, as long as there were still questions we didn't have answers for, they would still believe that, well, right, that's where God is, mm -hmm. <laughs> is in those unanswered questions. Right. I think that they would say, well, you know, yeah, you still have things to figure out. That's the whole point. That's why we're on this earth is, is to figure out what still needs to be known because of this incredibly complicated thing called the natural world that's put here for us to figure out. And there's still a boundary between the known and the unknown. It may be in a different place now, 500 years later. Right. But I think they wouldn't be surprised that it hadn't disappeared. Our guests were Deborah Harkness and Jim Vogel. Our show is produced and edited by Mariel Carr. For Distillations, I'm Bob Kenworthy. And I'm Mikhail Meyer. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.